Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Tracy Phillips about her book, Looking In, Discover, Define, and Align the True Value of Your Life, Leadership, and Legacy. Tracy Phillips, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you so much, John. It's awesome to be here. It is a pleasure. I'm super excited to have a nice conversation. It was fun chatting in the pre-interview. You're joining us from North Carolina. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And it turns out you grew up and are from Colorado. And so we were talking a little bit about the snow and the mountains and skiing and such. And and really, Utah and Colorado are both great places for that. Uh, But North Carolina is also beautiful. Uh, It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm excited today to have the chance to chat about some really important topics as they relate to your book, Look looking in, discover, define, and align the true value of your life, leadership, and legacy. And I really love that value, finding that value, finding value alignment, and then really having that come into all aspects of your life, how you lead and serve other people, and ultimately what the legacy of your life will be. I think it's beautiful. As we get started, I wanted to share Tracy's bio with everybody. As an executive leadership and performance strategist, Tracy Phillips supports visionary business owners and corporate executives to learn and practice better communication, resolution strategies, decision-making, and leading during times of change and when the stakes are high. She teaches her clients how to create a more cohesive, cooperative, experience and environment within their workplace culture. Her ultimate goal is to support her clients to live authentically and lead powerfully by creating more awareness about who they are, how they want to be seen, and what legacy they wish to leave behind. Again, what a beautiful background. I love everything in your bio. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further? No, I think, I mean, it covers it. You and I are both, I can tell just uh, by the way you speak, we're very succinct individuals. We try to take as much information and put it into uh, as, as minimal of a space as possible. So I think I, th- I think that pretty much covers it. Wonderful. Well, as we get started, why don't we begin with you telling us a little bit about why you wrote the book uh, and really the impetus behind it and the why behind your book? Absolutely. Well, you know, and, and the kind of the way the book was developed was, you know, why people say, gosh, that's a long title, but a short book, <laughs> you know, so we, I, my whole premise for the book is to take that beginning stage that I work with a lot of clients on discovering, which is what I refer to as zone of genius, right. Or zone of brilliance and zone of achievement. And really to understand the distinction between the two and how the way in which we've been looking at this and valuing ourselves and identifying ourselves in life has has either served us or not served us, depending on those those definitions and and how we utilize those. Um, And so really the book was about the idea of like leadership is an inside job is is what I say, Um, and understanding ourselves as those internal leaders how are we leading our thoughts? How are we leading our, our, our emotions? How are we, you know, really that concept of, you know, we're always focused on the external and we're conditioned to do so, but how much time have we really taken to define and understand the internal? Because that's really what ends up having us show up externally the way we, we do. Um, so getting clear on that is, is in my world is first and foremost. Um, so that's, that's what I focus on in, in my work and, you know, in my life as well. I, you know, I, I look at it as the peeling of the onion. People have, have used that analogy before. We never get there, wherever there is. 
Um, but it, it really is meant, I believe, to be a process of discovery that we're, we're also meant to enjoy. Um, I think a lot of times it's just, you know, once I get there, then I'll be happy. And, and the idea of the now is I'm happy now. Um, and through enjoying the process of, of discovery, you know, I build more of that. Um, and we tend to forget that. So it's just bringing that back into the forefront of our awareness. Yeah, I love it. It's all about the process, being mindful and, and present as you're going through the process, which includes ups and downs, um, really positive experiences, as well as the growing pains that are inevitable as we go through life and fumble around because we're imperfect individuals, despite whatever our best intentions might be. And so I really like the title, Looking In. As, as you mentioned, like there's all these different aspects of values and leadership and legacy. Those often are portrayed in a very external kind of uh, a way. You know, I want to influence other people. Well, that's great. And there's a, a time and a place for all of that. Um, but it does really begin with us and looking inside us and being able to really hold the mirror up in front of us and practice that regular self-reflection and a, a critical self-awareness so that we can discover blind spots and, and really fine tune our ability to connect with those around us. Uh, that's foundational as well to my leadership philosophy and approach. And I, and I believe like, just like you said, it's a lifelong process. Uh, we never arrive, we never achieve because we're always, always experiencing new things, new people, new situations. Uh, and regardless of what we think we might do when we're faced with challenging situations, we never know until we're there and we're in the middle of it. And then guess what? It's a new opportunity to learn, to grow, to figure out why we did what we did, uh, how we interacted with other people, why we did it the way we did it. And, and ultimately that's that opportunity for growth. So I love all of that. Um, and, I, and I think that's a really great why behind your book and why you you put so much time and energy and your heart and soul into sharing this message with more people. I think that's wonderful. Um, I appreciate that. May I say it. one thing about something you just said that I think yes. is so paramount? It's that many times we have learned that, you know, in retrospect, we, we learn the lessons, right? Like, oh, we went through this. And so let's go back and reflect on that and learn the lesson. But a lot of my work and talking about the book is that if we can be intentional and the key word in, in the book title is alignment, right? And alignment, you know, of all of these, these things ahead of time, it really, in fact, I tell a story in the book about that very process of getting crystal clear of who I am, how I want to show up and where I want to, you know, the outcomes I want to, or the environments I want to create, you know, in whatever it is I'm doing that I had something go completely South in, in a, a presentation I was uh, you know, I was giving. And because I was so intentional, that led, you know, to my course of action, right? That informed my course of action in such a way that at, at, at the end, when I was looking back, it's like, there's no way I think I would have dealt with that as favorably if I hadn't been pre-intentional about how I wanted to handle myself so that when things do not go as planned, you're kind of in that lane of, of intentionality and you've aligned that so that you're, you're navigating now the new waters in a very intentionally aligned lane. So, so that piece, I just want to say is that I do believe that, that hindsight is 2020 and we can learn by making mistakes or learn through, you know, in retrospect, but I also believe we can set ourselves up intentionally ahead of time to have even more success and alignment, um, which is really, again, like I said, a basis of, of a lot of the work that I do. Yeah. And the only way you can really do that is if you do that inner work in advance. Right. right. Um, right. And, and right. so you have to understand what your values are, what your approach is that you, you want to carry out. Otherwise, how can you possibly have alignment? <laughs> Otherwise you're just shooting from, you're just shooting from the hip. It's shotgun approach. And you're just, uh, you know, there's something to be said for rolling with the punches and being adaptable and whatever, and you can't prepare for everything. And I get that. But if you're, if you're doing the inner work in advance so that when you face these situations, you at least have some grounding about how you want to handle it, where you want to go with it, uh, then you're going to be in a much better place to be able to handle it well. And, it, you know, it's, it's like the old uh, metaphor. People have used it extensively in the past. You can't draw from an empty well. And so when you're, when you're put in those high tension, um, volatile types of situations where, where stress and anxiety levels are high, people are looking to you, there's fear, anxiety, uh, trepidation, 
what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? If you don't have anything in your well to, to pull out of the reserve, you know, chances are it's going to go pretty darn poorly and it'll give you plenty of, of things to think about and, and to try to do better the next time for sure. Uh, but we, we don't need to, uh, we don't need to completely fall on our face in order to have opportunities to learn and grow. So let's prepare in advance. I think that's a really, really great point. Absolutely. Well, it's what, you know, certain people in history, like um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in his I Have a Dream speech is a perfect example of that. You know, he he pre-wrote out, or at least his his writers helped him write, you know, his, his speech, his original speech. And by preparing kind of where his mindset was, what he wanted to say, the basic message, what he was inviting people into as far as his vision, he was able to kind of set that stage. Well, as we well know, if you look at the original um, the original uh, speech that he was going to give and the one he ended up giving, they're, they're drastically different. Um, and so what, but what that original you know, speech set him up to do was to go off script, was to be in the moment, was to take what the one woman said, tell him about the dream and go with that. Um, and so I think that, that what you said is absolutely true. You know, we plant the seed and we have to have faith and trust that we will know what to do when we need to tend for it, once it sprouts, and that may look different than what we thought, but just in the the, the premeditated, not to the nth degree of planning, but just understanding kind of where our general, where do we stand in place and time, right? Where do we position ourselves? What do we believe? What do we not believe? You know, those types of things are very important to get clear on, um, to your point that, that, you know, once we show up in whatever presents itself, and certainly the last couple of years have taught us that, um, that that we aren't just scratching our heads and wondering where where we are in all of this mess, right? That we at least have a clear definition of where we stand, and so that we can you know operate from that space of clarity. Yeah, and I mean we could apply this in so many different areas, but I think uh, in terms of moral and ethical decision making, for example, it's okay. super easy to fall into the trap of of just doing the easy thing uh, and justifying it and, and using kind of a utilitarian ends justify the means kind of an approach to how we make decisions. Uh, you can justify almost anything, you know, when you're using that kind of an approach and, you know, I, I, greatest good for the greatest number, that's not necessarily a bad approach. Um, but I, I think a lot of times leaders are a bit lazy, frankly, in their thinking and decision-making because they haven't done the inner work and the value alignment in advance. So when they get into those difficult situations, you know, yeah, it, this is a really ethically thorny kind of a decision that I need to make. How, what am I going to do and how am I going to respond? Uh, many organizations and leaders have had to do this during the midst of the pandemic. And it's, mm -hmm. it's super challenging. And guess what? When the pressure's on, chances are, if you haven't done this work in advance, you're going to make less morally and ethically defensible kinds of decisions, ones that in fact, you might be embarrassed about down the road when you look back and you, you're like, oh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I exploited people that way. I can't believe, you know, all in the name of the greater good, all in the name of the ends justify the means. And so let's, let's get beyond that. Let's look at values. Let's look at our, 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 the importance of, of our role and the duty we play towards, you know, the key constituencies and stakeholders around us. And when we can do that, then, you know, when we really hit those kind of ethical dilemmas in our life and in our leadership, we are much better situated to, to make decisions that we can live with, that we can look ourselves in the mirror at the end of the day and actually say, yeah, you know what, that was tough. I understand. I can't please everyone. But that was something that is consistent with my values, what's important to me, and what's consistent and important with the values of the organization. Uh, and you can come to much better uh, decisions, much better implementation of those decisions. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, that's going to help you, your team, your organization thrive. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. 
check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Absolutely. Well, and you know, we see a lot of what I call modern day martyrdom. You know, so we look in the past, you know, with the martyrs, they might have fought for a cause, but what it did, what did it cost them? It cost them their lives most of the time, right? So modern day martyrdom is exactly what you're talking about is, is that when we martyr ourselves to the cause, but we're not really aligning ourselves to, to our own morals and values. I saw tons of that when I worked at, at Butner Federal Prison here in North Carolina, working with ex-executives, right? These, these guys who, again, had been positioned to have a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility, you know, the whole entire organization, sometimes large fortune 500 companies, you know, where they were making these decisions and they found themselves kind of in, 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 you know, challenging waters and then making the quick decision. Well, it ended them up in federal prison. I mean, it's not one decision that can do that sometimes, but usually it's a, it's a series of decisions made in the wrong direction or out of that integrity. Um, because they're trying to, again, sacrifice for the greater good. Well, sacrifice is still sacrifice. And a lot of times that doesn't lead us, you know, to the growth and the prosperity and the healthy way in which we, we really want to lead. Um, and so that's, that was a lot of what I learned by working with these men in prison, which really set me up for, you know, the type of leadership that I, you know, coaching that I do today is understanding what it takes to be in those positions, you know, what, ha- and what also can happen when we're not intentional about how we're leading in those spaces. Yeah. And and let's zoom in on that a little bit Um, because leadership is hard. Uh, No, nobody's suggesting it's not, it's, it's a really tricky business. It's a lonely, lonely business. Um, And I just take the, during the pandemic, for example, there's been lots of talk, talk about the importance of empathy and compassion in leadership. Uh, And so you can provide support for your people right? And accommodations as necessary and, and help them to bring their whole authentic self to work. It can be really hard. Like who's supporting the leader in that same way? Uh, yeah. who, who, who's providing the emotional and psychological support to the leader who's bearing a huge burden? Uh, that can be a really, really challenging thing. And so when we recognize that, uh, it, it can allow us a little bit of uh, patience and compassion uh, and generosity, perhaps, and judgment towards how we approach those in, in really difficult uh, leadership types of positions. And it, it hopefully will help us recognize the need uh, to help share the weight and the burden of leadership. And hopefully leaders will understand that need as well so that they can disperse the, the weight um, through delegation and through empowerment and, and really giving other people the opportunity to contribute so that they don't bear the weight all themselves. Uh, with all of this yeah. said, you know, what, what do we need in leadership today? It's, it's this super difficult, challenging time to be an effective leader. What do you see in your coaching work and and the work that you do with executives? Yeah, well, you just hit on something that you and I share a very similar perspective. It's, you know, a lot of people are speaking from the angle of the workforce, right? So the work, what the workforce and the people need and the culture needs are leaders who do X, Y, and Z or who are X, Y, and Z. So we're hearing a lot of that out in the external world, what leaders need to do. But what we're not hearing a lot of is, and and even having a a perspective on, is what the leaders have to deal with. And the fact we've been in a paradigm of leadership that has taught completely opposite, um, you know, skill sets, right? So so that authority, being an authority, you know, having the answers that that's typically been, you know, the, the kind of fight, the, the one that is, has the mighty, you know, approach that can push through it, that, that kind of is, is again, you know, more of the one in charge for so long. That's how we have subscribed leadership, you know, to, to the equation we've looked at leaders. And so then all of a sudden we're changing, you know, that paradigm. And, and, and yet what I'm hearing a lot of is this demand, right? The more we kind of push this idea of empathy, Great. It's kind of like the idea of presence. We need to be present. Okay. So how do you do that? You know, I see so many people say, great. It sounds wonderful. 
but how do I do that? Do you have some strategies or tools or tips, you know? And, and I think that's the key piece that to your point is pulling back and saying, we're in this together because I hear a lot of that demand of, you know, leaders need to be more empathetic. Leaders need to understand their culture better. Leaders need to, but I also feel that the work the workforce needs to look at their piece. I mean, let's just look at DEI, for example, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We can, we can even create that in an environment, in an organization, right? We, we diversify, we create equity and, and, and inclusion, but if the, the workforce itself doesn't show up, right? We can make room at the table, but if you don't show up and play your role, then, then, then that is not, I mean, the leader can't make you, we can't lead people to water, but we can't force them to drink. And so I think that everybody gets to look at their piece in this. I think it's not just about pointing a finger, you know, and saying, okay, this is what's going to make this going to be, you know, the, the fix it all, right? Is that if leaders change their ways, then everything will be great. No, it, everybody plays a role. And it reminds me of a great book that I, I read that was, uh, that came out, I think in 2018 called The Coddling of the American Mind. And in it, the authors talked about this, this trend, you know, in the universities where, you know, university students are basically saying to university professors, I am not going to study that content because it triggers me. And it created this whole trend in some organization or in some, uh, in, in some establishments where, you know, the, the administration was actually saying to the professors, you know, your students are going to tell you what is okay you know, for them and what isn't. And, and, and that just flips the entire thing, you know, because now we're not having a two-way conversation. It's just a one-way conversation in the other direction, right? So if we feel that leaders have been the authority kind of dictating it all, now we're seeing it from the other end. And neither one of those is, is an effective way to find the solutions that I think we're really looking for. And so that's the one thing that I say is that, you know, as leaders come to the table, you know, don't stick your tail between your legs and just immediately say, okay, whatever you need, that's what I'm going to create because that's not what's needed. It's really having the hard and, and sometimes more challenging conversations, you know, and having everybody hold responsibility, right, for the culture that's created. And so where as a leader, you may be challenged in knowing how to approach that because you've never done it that way before. Not that you don't want to and not that you can't, but you just don't know what you don't know. And on the other side, what are you inviting people to? Because just fixing it for them and making everything perfect for them is not going to create the culture that is sustainable. So these are some things that I'm really seeing some more challenging. And I really find that it tends to be that pendulum, at least in the United States, that pendulum swing thing where, you know, we go so far one direction and then we try to rectify it by going completely in the opposite. And, and really it's more about a moderation and a balance and everybody recognizing that we all take responsibility for creating the environments in which we want to be. Uh, and that it is no one yeah. person's responsibility. Yeah, certainly mutual accountability needs to take hold. And, for sure. and, and so we want to foster that within organizations. Uh, I need to foster that within myself, that kind of uh, idea that I need to hold responsibility and accountability for my actions and how I interact with my team. I need to foster a culture within my team uh, where, where they can understand that I have that expectation for them and we're going to hold each other mutually accountable. You know, that will create a dynamic environment where people can bear the burden and the weight of the, the organization and the leadership that needs to occur. So I, I think that's wonderful. Uh, I note the time and before we wrap up, I thought uh, we could also talk just a little bit more about legacy because that's something you focus on in your book. I think that's a, a super important topic. Tell us a little bit more about why that's important to you and what we can do in fostering our own legacy. Yes. And so this is a piece that I see a lot. My particular niche is working with visionary leaders, right? So, so I do work with a very particular type of breed of individual uh, in leadership. Um, and, and that word tends to resonate very strongly with visionaries specifically, you know, because they're here to carry those visions forward. So legacy is, is pretty much their mission. You know, what are we creating for the next generations? You know, once I'm gone, you know, what do I want to leave behind? Um, and I think in general, if we think about it as human beings, it's important. We just oftentimes lose sight of it. But legacy can be even what do I want to create next week, right? Because, you know, again, it isn't just once I'm gone, what is the culmination of everything I've created? I mean, the culmination is in the now, right? So it's the now and then the now and then the now and how that all adds up. But, but understanding legacy really is about looking at three parts. You know, there's the what, what is the value I have to bring or the value I, I, I want to establish? 
how do I want to approach delivering that value into the world? And then where am I taking this? Where, what am I creating in the, and what are my outcomes? Or what are those environments that I'm looking to create? And so again, from that intentionality, I believe there's, you know, people talk about um, selfless leadership or, you know, this idea of not being about the self. And I think it's a developmental process. I mean, if we look at children early on in our, in our, you know, younger years, you know, it's all about the self. It's very ego driven. Like we're very self-focused. Well, we will stay in that position if we don't develop onto the next stage. And if we don't have the support that we need to do that, we will stay in that position. So I don't believe that ultimately as humans, we came in to stay in this contemplating our belly button phase, you know, where we're just thinking about who am I and what's important for me and how do I protect myself and all these things. We really came here to serve and we came to serve in our greatest value, right? It's the innate value that I think is more important than the acquired value, but that is a secondary conversation and why the name of my company is The Innate Coach. But I think that understanding legacy is about our mission, Right. So we have this. It's not that we even have one mission. Maybe we have multiple missions, but it's understanding beyond what is that service. Right. Who am I? What do I have to give? How do I want to give that? What do I want to create? And where does that create value in the world? Right. Where is that value, both valuable and valued? And once we can get more clear on that, then we're making discerning decisions that put us in those opportunity placements that are much more aligned to that understanding that we've developed. And that changes as time goes on. So we're constantly asking these questions as we evolve. But it, it gets us closer to being intentional in the legacy creation. Because I think as soon, the sooner we can get to that phase where I know enough about who I am, how I am, and what I want to deliver, that now I don't need to focus on me anymore. I can focus on giving that into the world. Because to me, that's fulfillment. You know, there's two things I think we get to make a distinction on. Success and fulfillment. They're not the same. We can have lots of success and no fulfillment. We've all experienced that to some extent, right? We can have fulfillment and not success, but I think we're really here to have both. And it's about, but not confusing success for fulfillment, that if we have success, then we'll automatically be fulfilled. Because I think fulfillment is about serving from that authentic space of value, knowing that there's an alignment in how we deliver that. And then to those placements or those creating those, those, whether it's a culture, whether it's an idea, whether it's, you know, whatever that it is, feeding it into those places that we're really meant to, that's all about fulfillment, right? We're going to feel fulfilled when we're doing that, right? And the simplest way to know is we're happy. We're happy. Yeah. We're happy doing those things. We can work really hard and we're still happy. That's going to, that's fulfillment. Yeah. And contentment, right? Yes. I, I, I love that. Thank you so much, Tracy. I note the time. I need to let you go here just a minute. But before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, where they can find your book, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Absolutely. So they can find me. The best way to find me and all my stuff is at my on my website, and that's uh, theinnatecoach.com. Uh, I also have a freebie. So if anybody's listening and you're a visionary and you want to know a little bit more about you know some of the things that I have for visionaries, I have a freebie giveaway. So you can always reach out to me. Uh, it's Tracy at theinnatecoach.com, and Tracy's spelled with an I, T R E C I. Um, so I'm happy to you know connect with people for that. Um, but really, the the point that I try to make in the book, and it's less than 200 pages. So for those of you who, you know, you don't have a lot of time to read a lot of stuff. Um, you know, it really is a succinct way to kind of dive into more in detail what we've talked about today. Um, it's a great read. You can also get it on my website or at Amazon or Barnes and Noble online. Um, but really, I would say that, you know, doing this work as Jonathan, or, you know, as John said, you know, is, is really paramount to being able to find that fulfillment, that success, that whatever you want externally, um, we really get to start within. So that's, you know, that's my main message and, and that's the one I stick to. Thank you, Tracy. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Tracy can do for you. Check out her book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. 
To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership Ordinary, Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.